Hey, everybody. What about the story of Daniel? How about Daniel chapter 2? Have you ever studied the, the beast in Daniel 7 and the statue in Daniel chapter 2? Do you realize those are the same kingdoms just told from a different perspective? Well, we got a guest in the studio today that you're going to enjoy. Uh, I heard him teach a Sunday school class at a church nearby, and I asked him to come in the studio today. He's sitting right here, and he's going to discuss with us the the kingdoms of the world from uh, from Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and of course Revelation 13. He's going to tie some things together for us. I think you're really going to enjoy the show this week. Welcome everybody, Brother Dan Goodwin here. This is Prophecy in the Spotlight. I'm your host and sitting with me in Dr. Hiltabittle's chair is a younger version of a Dr. Hiltabittle. We've got Kyle Smith with us today. Tell the audience a little bit about, about who you are, what you do over there in, uh, in your hometown. Yeah, so I'm from Victory Baptist Church in Carterville, Illinois, and I'm one of the assistant pastors. I've been on staff there for about eight years now, and I'm a Bible teacher teach in the Bible Institute, I teach in the Christian school, and pretty much uh, that, that is my area of service. I get to teach the Bible, and uh, verse by verse, line upon line, book by book, that's, that's, my, that's my method. All right. Well, I was at, uh, of course, uh, I was at your church a few weeks back, and you happened to be teaching on Daniel 2 and 7, and uh, man, that was great. I enjoyed it. And uh, we went out and ate, and then I, I was, I don't know, I was talking to my wife or somebody, I said, you know what, I'm going to. I'm going to bring him on the show uh, because you're right down the line with what I believe. I'm not saying we agree on everything. I don't, I don't know anything we don't agree on, but we always disagree on something. But, but if we do, I'm right. <laughs> yes, but, sir. Uh, but uh, no, uh, man, you taught, you taught that class. I asked you later you know, if you had notes. You didn't even have notes, I don't, I don't no, think. So, uh, so you, sat up, uh, you, you, you stood up there and did a 45-minute, 40-minute lesson you know, off the cuff with your Bible open and it was great. It was good stuff. Thank you. So I thought we'd, 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 we'd uh, bring you on here and let you share with our audience uh, some things about Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter uh, 7 and uh, a little bit in Revelation 13. Um, of course, Daniel chapter 2, everybody's familiar with the statue. Right. The statue. Everyone's, everyone that's looked at prophecy has seen a, the, the picture of the statue with the gold head and, and uh, you know, and of course, it goes with the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. So, so let's jump into this. Let's uh, see what you can share with our audience about this. Tell us about Daniel two and wh what your take is on it. Yeah, absolutely. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and in the dream, he sees the image of a man, and that man is divided from uh, his head is divided from his chest and arms, which is divided from his belly and his thighs, which is divided from his legs, which is kind of divided from his feet. So he sees an image of a man, and that this image uh, is a prophecy to Nebuchadnezzar about the future kingdoms. And here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Whether or not he remembers the dream, we can't be certain of. But he goes to his wise men. He says, hey, tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what my dream means. And they couldn't do it. And so and, he's going to. And we know he didn't know what it meant. Right. Absolutely. But, but we talked about this in the preview. I asked you what, why God didn't, why he didn't remember the dream. And you said it's possible that he did remember the dream, but that that was a test to the wise men to make sure they were telling him the truth. That's if possible, the, right? If the wise men could tell him what he dreamed, then probably what they told him it meant. Would That's be a good true. point. See, I'd never heard that perspective before. You, that could be right. Yes, sir. So the wise men failed. They can't do it. Well, here comes Daniel. And Daniel's brought before the king. And Daniel tells the king, I've got the answer, although it's not from me, it's from the God of heaven. And then he goes to tell him not only what he dreamed. Didn't he make that famous statement, interpretations belong to, to God. God? I like That's that. That's right. Powerful. Gave God the glory. Absolutely. For so he told him what the dream meant as well. And so since he could tell him what he dreamed, then Nebuchadnezzar could be certainly sure that what he said the interpretation was carried some, some truth to it, right? 
So in the, in the dream, or rather, here's what he says, just to give you what the scripture says. Daniel 2.31, he says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. The form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Then he sees a stone. Now we'll not read all the verses, but there's a stone that is... I like this part. There's a stone that's cut out of a mountain, and that stone is cast... Cut out without hands. Without hands is what it says in verse 34. That stone is cut out of that mountain without hands, cast at the feet of that image, and then that image crumbles. And then that stone grows up into a great mountain, which he, he tells Nebuchadnezzar about later on. So he gives him the dream. This was the dream, and then the interpretation. Verse 38, thou art this head of gold. Just like in the preview, Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. Then he says, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So, you know what we find out? The top is the most valuable, and then afterwards, we, it degrades. So gold, and then, and then silver. silver's next. Right, and then belly and thighs of brass, and then iron, and then iron and clay mixed so those kingdoms lose value over time and really it's those kings nebuchadnezzar had all power but then go on and read about darius and the fact that he didn't have all power and from there on out you end up not only with a republic but then a democracy and then a, anyways it, it really degrades over time yeah so he gives them here the dream and the interpretation nebuchadnezzar babylon the head of gold a kingdom after thee daniel chapter 5 Babylon to Persia, the kingdom after Persia. Verse 39, another third kingdom of brass. We go from Persia to Greece. That's Daniel chapter 8. And then verse number 40, the fourth kingdom, which is of iron. That's that strong, powerful kingdom. You know what else you see? Not only do you see the kingdoms lose value, but they harden. Right. Gold is more malleable than silver and so forth. As you go down, you see the kingdoms of this world harden themselves ultimately against God. Boy, aren't we seeing that same thing take place here in America? Absolutely. We got a, the, the, the capital surrounded by fence and, and razor wire and soldiers. It's, it's like the people don't matter anymore. It's Right. That kingdom hardened against man, hardened against God. So that fourth kingdom is of iron. And I was mentioning in the preview that that, that iron kingdom... Uh, the fourth kingdom, it's the fourth kingdom. It's not, it, you don't read about a fifth kingdom. So what I, what I tried to assure the folks there at Victory in that Sunday school lesson is I don't believe the West will ever lose power. I, I'm not worried about China. I'm not worried about North Korea. Because according to the scripture, it's the fourth kingdom that's in power whenever the stone smashes the feet yeah. of the image. So it's Western power. Now, most prophecies people, books you read, they call it a revived Roman Empire. I think that's what right. you're saying. It, it's that same kingdom that kind of falls away, but it's still there. But all of a sudden at the end, it comes back together, only different. Right, absolutely. And that's what you see. Again, we go fourth kingdom. We don't read about a fifth kingdom. Why? Because Rome is still in operation. So head of gold, Babylon, chest and arms of silver, that's Persia, belly and thighs of brass, Greece, legs of iron, and then you don't read about a fifth kingdom, all of a sudden in verse 41, you start talking about the feet and the toes. So that Roman influence never dies. And the feet hold it all up, don't they? Absolutely. They hold up the whole statue. And obviously it's on shaky foundation because it's iron and clay mixed. Whatever right. that final representation of Rome is, it's not of its previous power. And it's diversity. And I talk about in my book, diversity doesn't strengthen, it weakens. Absolutely. We're and all about diversity. We got to be diverse, diverse, diverse. You know, you have different languages, different cultures, different, different religions, different this, different that. What, what does that do? It weakens the army. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the feet of iron and clay mixed with the ten toes, and those toes turn out to be kings. And that stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands hits the image in the feet, which is super important because I would, I would assume, I think I know you well enough to know that you're premillennial. Oh, yeah. We, we believe the premillennial position is that Christ comes 
to destroy the kingdoms to set up his own. We do not believe, and let me say this, the Bible does not teach that we're going to bring in this utopia after which Christ will come yeah. and put his stamp of approval on it and, and call that his kingdom. No, the kingdoms of this world degrade until the point where Christ comes in a catastrophic, catastrophic and cataclysmic event where he destroys the kingdoms, at which point he sets up his own kingdom. I don't know how you say both of those words in one sentence and get them right. Because <laughs> I can't do it. I managed to make it work. So he hits it. That's what you see in verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. And that stone hit it, grows up into a mountain, and that's Christ's kingdom. Now what you see in Daniel chapter 2 is mirrored in Daniel chapter number 7 with the beast. And you can actually look there in Daniel 7. This time, the representation of these kingdoms is not metals, it's beasts. Verse number four, the first was like a lion. And I'll, all not, right. I'll so not read them in all. Daniel, in Daniel 2, you had King Nebuchadnezzar, a lost man at the time, right. having a dream. Right. You may have remembered it, maybe not, but it's interpreted by the man of God, Daniel. Right. And there's a prophetic lesson about the whole future of the world, all the way to the Antichrist kingdom. Absolutely. So Daniel 7 is a different, different guy having the dream, right? It is. This one, it's Daniel. You read about that in verse number one. In the first year of Belshazzar, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head. So this time it's not the king, it's the prophet. He has the dream, he has the visions. Yeah. And there's many, many details we could really dive into that are a lot of fun. But ultimately, four beasts, the first one like a lion, and this one, it was made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. That's kind of what you saw there with Nebuchadnezzar in chapter number four. He lost his mind mm -hmm. for seven years, at the end of and which, grass, yeah, right? at the end of which, God restores him back to his sanity and to his position as king. So you can really see that in verse number four, the parallel. With, and I think with Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar gets, becomes a believer too. I'm absolutely convinced yeah. that Nebuchadnezzar gets born again. And obviously, we could talk about prophecies, but that right there is the single most important thing a person needs to get the right conclusion on. The fact they need to be born again. Nebuchadnezzar got saved. Yeah, what difference does it make if you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib if you're lost? If you're lost, it doesn't <laughs> matter when Christ comes. You're damned either way. Yep. You are condemned. Yep. So he sees in his dream this first beast, it's a lion. That would be Babylon. The second beast, which is a bear, verse number five, like to a bear. And he gives some great description there of that beast, how that it, it devours much flesh. It was a conquering kingdom. That lines up with Persia. Then the, the third beast, in verse number six, I beheld, lo, another like a leopard. So you got a lion, you've got a bear, you've got a leopard, and that would be the strength and the ferocity and the speed of a leopard in that Grecian kingdom led by Alexander the Great. A kid. A kid. But man, what a conquering king. Yeah. So he led that Grecian empire to world dominance. And then... After that kingdom, you read there in verse number 7 that he saw a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. He didn't say what kind it was. The first one's a lion. Second one's a bear. Third one's a leopard. What's in this one? He just said it was a terrifying, terrible, intimidating beast. He couldn't really describe it, it looks like. Well, what do you have? You have a beast with, verse number 7, ten horns. And then in this, you have a horn pops up that ends up being the Antichrist. But you've got, again, four kingdoms. And those four mirror the four mentioned in Daniel chapter 2. All right, so this, this thing, he, he sees this final kingdom that's going to become the Antichrist kingdom. And he, he doesn't call it by a, an animal's name. He calls it a dreadful beast. Right. Now, could that be because it's, part, it's all of them together like some kind of a monster? Absolutely. Matter of fact, we find that out in Revelation 13 that it's, I use the term, it's an amalgamation of all the kingdoms before it. Exactly right. And, and that, that fits with the two feet and the toes holding up. It's holding up what? The entire thing. Absolutely. From the head of gold, yep. the, 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 the breast, or the, the, the shoulders and all that, the thighs. It's all being held up by the feet. So all the kingdoms that he talked about all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar are all going to be, because Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is Babylon. That's important because right. Babylon 
the system of Babylon has a big part to play in this end time game that's coming here. Absolutely. In fact, it's, it's kind of here now. And so that's all part of the, the, the Roman Empire, the, the Babylons, uh, the Medes and the Persians, they all, Alexander the Great, all them kingdoms are, the, that's kind of what he saw. And it, it's a dreadful, it's a dreadful beast. And if you see the old pictures from hundreds of years ago, and I've got some in, in my books, when they show these beasts, I mean, they're dreadful looking. They got Absolutely. seven heads sticking out and they look like a leper and a bear's head and Absolutely. They they seems like they understood that they understood back hundreds of years ago when they drew these pictures right. that this final kingdom was going to be all of them kind of absolutely it would have portions or part of each of those kingdoms working in it and ultimately it's an unstable kingdom again we saw that in Daniel chapter two with the iron and the clay mixed and they don't mingle they they don't mix so it's an unstable kingdom which ultimately is torn down by Christ. So this fourth kingdom is the fourth kingdom of Revelation 13. As a matter of fact, if you look over there in Revelation 13. All right, while you're going there, let yep. me tell the folks about uh, the Revelation study guide here. Folks, we're, uh, if you are interested in some of this, uh, my Revelation study guide has uh, a lot of this that he's talking about. In fact, I've got a chart in here that lists everything he just said about the bear and the leopard and the dreadful beast. Uh, I got a chart here that shows the statue, the chest of arms of silver, and the belly of thigh, and all that. Just got it all there laid out for you. So it's a Revelation study guide, and you can go to the website, crossingthespolly.com. Just go to my bookstore, and you can order that if you, if you don't have it already. We also have it in a PDF that we can email to you if you'd like to have it that way. Um, so um, Crossing the Spotlight's where you go to do that. And also, if, you, uh, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, if you'd like to help us stay on the air, we have a donate button right there on the website where you can donate and uh, help us stay on the air. We also have uh, a special offer that we just shared a week or two ago. Uh, my book about Henry VIII, uh, Henry the 500-year-old prophecy of Henry VIII. You can donate there and get that they get that free gift package deal that we have there. Um, okay, so, all right, I hope that'll be a help to you. All right, well, let's jump back into this exciting stuff. Let's get back into this. So you were headed to Revelation 13. Yeah, so in Revelation 13, this is where you find out that what Daniel saw in chapter 7 is in Revelation 13, here's why. The beast has 10 horns, and when you, when you compare how this beast is described, it's the same terminology almost word for word what you read in Daniel chapter 7. We didn't read down in that chapter after we looked at the fourth kingdom, but you learn that those four beasts are four kings, which are four kingdoms, and that fourth one was the one that Daniel was really interested in. Ten horns, that one horn. In that fact, he, I know you didn't bring it out, but he did. He said, he said, Explain that one to me. That was the one that got his attention. He said, Absolutely, because he saw the lion. Didn't it say he marveled he, at that he, one? Right. He saw the lion. He kind of gets what a lion is. He saw the bear. He understands what a bear is. The leopard, that makes sense. That last one turns out to be a seven-headed, ten-horned monstrosity. you know what he monstrosity. saw? He saw what's here right now. Right. He saw mod the modern world. And that's why he marveled. That's, that's why he said, of, of all those, I need to find out what that one's all yeah, about. He probably saw planes and jets. And, I mean, he saw stuff he couldn't. Matter of fact, the chapter ends with Daniel saying that his cogitations much troubled him. You know, not much changed in 1,000 or 1,500 years of history. Right. But all of a sudden, you get past the 1900s, of course, the industrial age, right. the nuclear age, and all, all of a sudden, Explosion computers and knowledge. phone, who could have understood any of that? Right. It seems to me that that's kind of what he saw, because he saw that final kingdom, right? And he marveled at it, right? And I, and I used to say, well, why didn't why didn't he detest it? He was fascinated by it. He saw planes and and whatever modern equipment he saw, and he marveled at it. Absolutely, he was he was bothered at the at trying to understand it. See, this is the thing. This is why I love the Be like when we show. were kids in the Jetsons. Remember the oh, Jetsons? Absolutely. You're not old enough, but the but, Jetsons, they were way beyond that. Absolutely. Star Trek. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, th this is why this, this show is important. People have lost a sincere desire to understand prophecy whenever a good majority of this book is prophecy. And Daniel, he saw yeah. something he didn't understand, and he wanted to understand it. 
And it was, it was a mind-blowing moment. But what he saw was that final kingdom out of which the Antichrist would rise and dominate. The Bible says in Daniel 7 that he would prevail against the saints. That's what you read about here yeah. in Revelation 13. He overcomes them. And that's not the church. It, it, it's, it's saints as in believers, uh, yeah, but that's the not the church. Gone. The church is gone. Yeah. We don't experience one second of the Antichrist dominating now, power. Now, Revelation 13, he gives them backwards. That's right. That's what I was going to point out. So in Revelation 13, verse number 1, he says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now here's the beast. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So he looked, and he said, it's a leopard, kind of a bear, kind of a lion. And the order he gives them, to your point, is the exact reverse order that Daniel gave in chapter 7. In Daniel 7, lion first, then bear, then leopard. Revelation 13, he said it's a body of a leopard, then the feet of a bear, then the mouth of a lion. And, and why is that the, the case? Daniel 7, he's looking forward to the kingdoms. And in Revelation 13, we're looking, looking backwards. backwards, right? Yeah. But you see a portion, the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear. Each kingdom in this final kingdom has some operating effect. Whatever was at work in the leopard kingdom is at work in the final kingdom, and the same with the bear and the lion. So it's, in a, it's, in a, it's a conglomeration of all the previous kings before it. But this, this kingdom with the ten horns is the same kingdom you read about in Daniel chapter number so seven. So what is your opinion of the significance of the, the different story, the, the statue with the gold, the metals, versus the, the beast? What's your understanding of why they're looked at differently? I, I think they're looked at differently because I think the Lord is trying to emphasize what happened in Daniel 2. You saw a man that was given um, a dream, and it would be from the pagan king, right? From the pagan king's perspective, right. he sees the kingdoms of the world. What are they? Gold. They're valuable, right? Daniel chapter 7, through the prophet of God, it's been said, and I'm not the one to start this, but it's been said that Daniel 7 is from God's perspective, Daniel 2 from man's perspective through Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, man looks at the kingdoms of the world as, as powerful things, valuable money, a way to achieve power and Absolutely. money and wealth and nice palaces and homes. Absolutely. And uh, Daniel chapter 7 is God telling Daniel what he, how he looks upon the kings of the world. So explain these beasts. What, what is God saying there? Here's what he's saying. And, and, and people have seen this. You know what you see out there in the world from God's perspective? Again, you, you nailed it on the head when you mentioned man. What do we see with the kingdoms? Power, dominance, value there, attempts at prosperity, gaining position and prestige. But from God's perspective, what does he see? He sees deadly creatures. A lot. Do you want to meet a lion? Do you, do you want to run into a bear? How about a leopard? Nobody wants to encounter that kind of ferocious, dangerous, terrible beast. It is, it is the sin nature of man encapsulated. You know what you see? You see out there in that world with the kingdoms, you see dirty, filthy, terrible creatures is what you see. Now our founding fathers, and I think I talk about this in the Revelation here, the founding fathers understood what you're talking about. They understood these wild beast kingdoms. Yeah. And it's said of the founding fathers, I think maybe in their own writings, or somebody said it of them, but um, the Constitution was given to be chains around the ankles of the beast, the government, to restrain it. The Constitution and, and the Bill of Rights on it was to restrain this beast because they knew as the beast ate and grew and received tax money, Absolutely. and people get, in, get into office and they stay there for 10, 20, 30 years, the... the the people don't matter. It, it, it grows. It becomes a wild beast. And the only way to keep it at bay is to restrain it with chains. Yeah. And they said the change was the Constitution. The Constitution is supposed to keep the government from, from doing things that it's not supposed to do. The problem today is we've kind of gotten away from it. They're trying to throw the Constitution out. 
Because yeah, in a lot of ways, they they have. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Sad. Yeah. And uh, and you know the, the government's something to be feared. Yeah. When it's when it's re, when it's not restrained. Absolutely. And we we can see that in history. I mean, governments. I've read governments have killed more people than 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 wars have. I mean, go, I mean. It was in God's design for the government to be submitted to Him and to be a tool against evil doers, or rather, I, it's not, it doesn't say tool, it says a terror, right? A terror to evil works, right. evil doers. Uh, unfortunately, who's determining who the evil doers are? Well, in, in our country and in countries around the world, the leaders are determining who the evil doers are. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times they turn that to be Christians. Now, Donald Trump comes along, walks into this beast system, and even he said that he didn't, nobody could have ever understood how how bad it was, and how deep, as he calls it, the swamp. Swamp, yeah. Uh, you know, when you understand Daniel seven, you'll begin to understand the the swamp that Donald Trump talked about. I think he coined that, but yeah, you know, the swamp. We got to drain the swamp, and uh, you know, and of course, um, the guy who uh, I lost his name, um, the guy who who took over Babylon. Went through the sewer there. Yeah, Cyrus. Cyrus, there you go. And you were trying to come up with the name. Yeah. Uh, it said that he drained the swamp. He yeah. drained the sewer system so they could go under there. Right. And because right. a lot of, there's a lot of likenesses with Donald Trump to uh, King Cyrus. Cyrus moving the embassy. In fact, Absolutely. in Israel, they have, they have signs and coins with you know, Trump as Cyrus. That, right. You know, they see that. Well, uh, brother, we got about a minute, maybe a minute, 15 seconds. Anything you want to? Close with him. Absolutely. You know, prophecy is incredible. I love prophecy. I love I love this show. I love the context of it. Well, you love me. Well, Dr. you know. Dr. Hiltabill, well, I mean. <laughs> but ultimately, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, it doesn't matter what kingdom's coming next. It doesn't really matter what kingdom's in charge. If you die without Christ, it's darkness and blackness and fire forever. Uh, every person out there needs to understand that they are themselves a, a beast in their sin. Yeah. They're vicious and in chains to their sin nature. And the only person who can overcome your sin nature and, and matter of fact, take away your sins and give you a home in heaven is the stone cut out of mountain without hands, the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll take away your sins. He'll make you perfect so you can gain heaven forever. And that's what we need. We need a Savior, and He's the only Savior. There are no other Saviors. He died on the cross, rose again, so that all men could have hope of eternal Amen. life. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Absolutely. Well, folks, you've been pro watching Prophecy in the Spotlight with my, my guest, Kyle Smith, and uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. I sure did. I had a ball. Uh, if you need any information about salvation, if you're unsure about something, contact us. We'd love to help you with that. Go to the bookstore, go to the website, check it out. Uh, uh, become a partner with us if you, if you can. But until next time, keep your eyes on the sky.